Hello, and thank you for joining this Tech for Good debate as part of the Davos Agenda as we continue the conversation today. I'm Karen Cho from CNBC. Globally, there was shock and recrimination about the U.S. insurrection on Capitol Hill. It was a violent reminder about the harm the Internet can bring, the social media fueling the outrage that we witnessed, and the former U.S. president posting, encouraging a, a dangerous mob. Meanwhile, vaccines, the main solution to end the pandemic, has also been the subject of lies and deceit. But events in 2020, with advertisers throwing their weight behind campaigns calling for change, created a watershed moment for tech giants that have become content gatekeepers. On that note, though, as we begin our panel on advancing digital content safety, let me introduce you to your speakers today. Her Excellency, Hesse Bint Esser Buhumeid, Minister of Community Development, Office of the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates. Maurice Levy, the Chairman of the Supervisory Board, Publicis Group. And A.B. Albrechtson, the Chief Executive Officer at Plan International. Thank you all so much for joining us. A little bit later on to weigh in on the, with some final thoughts on this discussion will be Kathy Lee, who is Head of Media, Entertainment and Sports Industries for the World Economic Forum. Just a couple of notes by way of housekeeping before we begin. The first 30 minutes will be a live discussion, and this is open to the public, so feel free to, to post your comments on the chat function, which you can see on the screen now. Following this, we will close out the discussion to the public and just segue to a more detailed private discussion for forum members and partners. So we look forward to continuing that for uh, uh, the full hour of the, of the conversation. Let's now begin our discussion as we tackle the topic at hand. Her Excellency, if I may just pivot to you first, please. In my introduction, I highlighted how social media can trigger political instability. The Washington scenes have highlighted the need for change. What role do you believe the government should play in tackling harmful content online? Thank you very much, Karen, and a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to our session, and thank you for having us. Well, the government can play um, a huge role um, when it comes to tackling harmful content uh, on the internet and on, on online. There are a couple of ways of doing so, and um, if you may allow me, I would go through a couple of the ideas that um, I would like to discuss. So putting in place uh, the right set of regulations and governance around the online content to start with, um, to criminalize the harmful acts and protect the victim's right is, should be um, an, a, a definitely a necessity. This includes having, for example, um, a sustainable law on, on the illegal online behavior, which the United Arab Emirates have done that back in 2000 and six and have went back and amended that law again in 2012. Another idea of, of, of how we can tackle that as government is by, by putting technical measurements tools and to provide uh, a quick response to, to such incidents. Uh, and and when we mean, uh, what we mean by a quick response, um, in this world, in the digital world, uh, we know that the pace, is, the, the pace is much faster. So us as government will need to be so agile, very equipped, ready uh, to such incidents. We need to ensure that we protect the government services that are being provided to the people. We should ensure that the harmful content is easily and quickly taken down to ensure the less of the spread of, of, of any harmful uh, acts. Um, Launching, for example, a national computer emergency response uh, team is, is, is a way to ensure that uh, you as a government um, and, as, and as a country is well equipped do, to do so. Um, um, I also believe that building cybersecurity capability is, uh, is a necessity um, that would be including to analyze and stop any threats, any threats uh, and, and to monitor and protect the digital uh, infrastructure of the government and also to allow governments to respond not only quickly but also effectively to such incidents. Um, another way to do so we also believe is 100% by raising awareness um, and about the digital and, and, and the security uh, to all people of the of the society and we also would want to focus uh, on the importance of having this awareness at a very early age to the new generations we have our students now 
all being, uh, I mean, um, having their distance learning, which means they are even much more exposed to, to, to such incidents. Our seniors as well. Life have changed over the last 12 months. We've all, we, we have all noticed that. We are more into ensuring a safe and a very effective platform for people to live through it. Um, my last point, if you may allow me, Karen, would be to, to, to really emphasize on leveraging the partnership, uh, international and national partnership, to ensure that the awareness, that the connection is there. Um, such harmful content will, uh, on the internet will only be acted on quickly if the right partnership is put in place and if the right direction is clear to everyone playing such a role. Uh, these threats need to be addressed, people need to be aware about them, and also need to be protected. Thank you very much, Karen. Minister, thank you very much for that detailed response. Maurice, if I can turn to you, less than two years ago, you held a fireside with Mark Zuckerberg as European lawmakers were demanding answers around Cambridge Analytica. Fast forward, uh, we've had the 2020 election, we've had a watershed year as advertisers demanded that these social media platforms change their policies. The latest election did see some labels po with uh, some posts with labels uh, with warnings about the content, but still the platforms allowed Trump to peddle a lie about voter fraud. And then we saw that deadly rampage on, in Washington. We finally saw responses as social media giants then blocked the leader of the free world. What's your view on how the social media platforms have performed over the past 12 months? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm uh, very happy to be in this very unusual uh, Davos meeting. Uh, we, we have been talking with the platform since uh, more than 10 years. And the very first time that we did it was in uh, Davos in a very heated conversation regarding the safe environment in which our clients should advertise and how uh, the platform should curate the content. And um, to be very honest, during a few years, they were in a denial. And since, uh, let's say, the uh, recent years and particularly the last election, not the, the, the very last one, but the previous one, they have started to uh, enter into a more active role in moderating or trying to curate the content. Today, there is uh, uh, three or four issues which are extremely important. The first one is that um, we must recognize that uh, the harmful content is huge, complex, difficult to manage. Uh, the, the minister has spoken about uh, the rules in Emirates and the necessity for uh, a a cooperation, an international cooperation, but the, if you look at the rules in the U.S. and the legal rules in the U.S., they are very different from uh, uh, the one in Europe. What is permitted in the U.S. in the name of uh, freedom of speech is not allowed in the European countries. Uh, the second aspect is the sheer size, uh, the volume of um, uh, hatred uh, uh, messages, violence messages, inappropriate messages. We are speaking about hundreds of million. So we recognize that it's not very easy. And last but not least, who should be uh, the custodian? And we believe that uh, the platforms have a role, but they should not be alone. That there should be a third party. They cannot decide uh, who has the right to speak and who has not the right to speak. They can obviously eliminate and curate the hatred content, but when it comes to decisions like, like the ones that we have seen recently on uh, um, uh, the uh, Trump decision, it's interesting to see that as long as he was president and despite the fact that he was... Uh, uh, issuing messages which were not really uh, very accurate, very true, and very honest, uh, they have not done anything. It's just when he was a lame duck that they decided that, yes, they, they will act. 
which is something which is debatable. And I believe that uh, 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 when it comes to uh, the authority of who should be speaking and who should not be speaking, we should not let them alone making the decision. Maurice, uh, interesting points there about the timing of those decisions taken by the social media companies. AB, let me turn to you because the societal impact of social media is not just important from a political standpoint, but also from an individual one. Girls and young women have penned an open letter to the content gatekeepers, effectively demanding more ways to report online abuse and more effective tools. Talk us through the scale of abuse that you're witnessing even in 2021. Yeah, so we uh, at Glenn International surveyed about 14,000 girls in, in, in over 22 countries. And these countries are across the world. There's no difference in the responses. Um, and 60% of girls and young women that are on social media platforms um, have experienced harassment and abuse online. I want to just highlight that what we're talking about is not virtual violence. This is violence and violence that has a huge impact on the girls, how they feel uh, mentally, but also how they feel physically when they are in the uh, public space. Um, about 20% of those that have experienced violence never come back to the social media platforms. It's so abusive that they decide this is not a space for them. And, and, uh, what we also see is that it leaves the girls feeling physically unsafe also when they leave their homes. So about um, and so about 20 percent of them say that they really don't feel like going outside anymore because they may meet uh, the perpetrators of violence. So it has a huge impact in the personal space for 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 thousands and thousands of girls. AB, thank you very much for that. Uh, Minister, if I can come back to you, the UAE's National Digital Wellbeing Program that's been unveiled this week aims to protect vulnerable groups as we're talking about young women especially. What is the Gulf state doing differently that other countries could think about adopting at this point? Um, thank you, Karen, for, for allowing us to highlight it. Actually, the session comes at the, at the perfect timing. Um, Three days back, the UAE have launched the digital well-being program. I mean, definitely this program, this well-being program, um, with its digital format, um, is going hand in hand in our general well-being program in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the, the, the digital well-being program is, is uh, actually based on what have been launched by cabinet uh, earlier this week, which is the national digital well-being policy, a full policy which is one of its Kind, um, that has a lot. I mean, one of its main core uh, initiatives uh, that come that came out out of the the so-called the UAE Digital Wellbeing Council. This council is being run by by himself, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, General um, His Highness Sheikh uh, Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Minister of Interior, with a membership of another ten um, federal and local um, ent government entities. This policy consists of what we call the four C's, four main pillars, uh, which we believe holistically will help the, the digital well-being of the United Arab Emirates people who live here, who visit here, and who, who would ever come in contact with, uh, with the United Arab Emirates. The first uh, component is, um, is on the digital capabilities. Uh, and we mean here by building digital capabilities and expanding on the digital knowledge of different segments within uh, the United Arab Emirates, whether it's children, youth, adults, senior citizens, and so forth. Um, the second uh, component is about the digital content, which is to basically to encourage the usage of positive content and providing solutions to reduce and report harmful content. Uh, the third uh, pillar is on the digital conduct. This conduct is basically done and, and put in place to promote positive behaviors and values in the digital world because it's no different than the real world. 
um, this uh, digital conduct conduct have been spreading since the last three days um, massively within uh, the United Arab Emirates to all platforms, to everyone in the society, to ensure that everyone is aware about it, and they actually sign up to this pledge of using the internet in a positive way. In being a good um, uh, example of a citizen that uses the content and the, the, the power of the, of the internet to the, to the benefits of all. The last uh, pillar is basically on the digital contact, uh, which is managing the relationships and providing means of online protection through regulations and laws. And here where a lot of awareness will be happening, not only for uh, school students, but even to other members of the society, right. caregivers, uh, parents, uh, you name it. Each, uh, each pillar uh, is, uh, is associated with a number of initiatives which are, uh, which are dedicated to vulnerable groups and, and to ensure that we are continuously building their digital capabilities and literacy to raise their levels of awareness. Um, if you may allow me, Karen, I do have some examples of how we would want to reach specifically some of our vulnerable groups, for example, uh, let's say children, um, enabling the digital well-being uh, and embedding the digital well-being knowledge in our educational system, um, right from the kindergarten all the way to grade 12. Uh, and these standards, just to ensure that um, Teachers, students, uh, parents at home, caregivers are aware of them. And this type of knowledge is actually being built up for students all throughout while they are um, going um, during their years. Um, to organize as well uh, regular interactive camps where right. parents can participate uh, to raise their awareness. Um, the ECF so-called school programs as well to ensure that our online safety policy is not only out there, but it's also, it's also practiced. Um, when it comes to caregivers as well, uh, we want to ensure that we are providing um, the right educational and uh, material guidelines to parents, educators, caregivers, uh, all throughout. We want to make sure that the parents' virtual awareness is, or is, is simple and it's out mm -hmm. there as well, easy to reach. Mm -hmm. um, Senior, our seniors, our people of determination, who we call people of determination, who are people of, of disability, uh, are already also included in this holistic national right. policy. It uh, sounds multifaceted. Maurice, let me come back to you because uh, what we saw over the course of last year, many big name clients uh, effectively joining a boycott against Facebook, yet we thought this would have a huge impact on the revenue model for a company that derives about 99% of its revenue from advertising. And then we learned that small advertisers are the ones that are having a dramatic impact on uh, supporting Facebook still. So we didn't see the revenue hit that we thought we would see from such dramatic action. Fast forward to, to this year, Facebook also picking up subscribers because of these pandemic trends. What is it going to take for the digital media companies to respond to what advertisers are doing and respond to the pressure that they're seeing beyond uh, some of the, the users at this stage? Uh, the revenue of uh, the platform are climbing simply because we are in a very specific situation due to the pandemic. Uh, as you know, people are at home. Uh, they are, uh, most of them, they are also uh, shopping uh, on the uh, internet. Uh, they don't go outside and therefore they are using massively internet. And uh, that's the reason why we see the, the revenue of the key platform growing uh, quite dramatically. And this is uh, something which we expect to continue in 2021. And this makes, by the way, uh, the responsibility of the platform even greater. We, as advertising agencies and publicists in particular, we have uh, insisted a lot and we have played a crucial role in uh, uh, drawing uh, not only a line uh, in the sand, but also defining uh, some 11 categories of harmful content. We want simply that um, the uh, advertising money of our client is going to a safe environment. We want our client to uh, communicate in an environment which is uh, reasonably safe. 
Now, you have to see that, uh, uh, and this has been mentioned by AB as well as by the minister, what you have to see that uh, the real world is not very different uh, from uh, uh, the uh, platform world, the virtual world, with a huge difference. Is that um, when you are uh, insulting someone privately, it remains private. It is uh, a, a something which is harmful for the person, but the echo is very limited. When you do that on internet, the echo is unlimited and you can hardly get it out of the internet and it takes days before uh, your complaint is recognized. So what we are doing for the time being through an organization which is called GARM is an alliance between the agencies, the key advertisers and the platform in order to have some strong rules uh, and making sure that they can respect that rules, those rules. What we see in nowadays is a clear conscious of the key uh, platforms, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, and when I say Facebook is the whole group, we, we see that they are starting to be extremely conscious of the need to uh, take out some content, to moderate some content. What they are doing is quite significant, but uh, as I said, the complexity and the size make it extremely difficult to root out all the negative content. It's complicated. I don't believe that um, uh, the uh, kind of... Um, uh, boycott or uh, uh, putting a finger uh, directly on, on some platform will really change uh, the situation. We need to work collaboratively. We need to be a good co uh, in a good cooperation with the platform in order to reasonably take out all this negative content. It's a long way to go. It will not be easy. And some strong advertisers will probably lead the way. Maurice, a moment ago, you mentioned the role of a third party in regulating the social media platforms. When it comes to the United States, seen as the light touch approach, there's a discussion about changing Section 230, where effectively the social media platforms have not been on the hook for any of the content posted. Should that change? Is that the third party that you're talking about? Uh, there are a, a few third party. What, what uh, AB is doing is, for me, considering uh, as a third party. What uh, BrandGuard is, uh, uh, sorry, NewsGuard is doing is also a, a third party. NewsGuard, I don't know if you know, it's it's this unbiased organization which look at the content of the website, the credibility of uh, uh, the journalist, uh, uh, the owners and they give a nutrition label uh, from um, uh, credible, so you have three red lights. Uh, uh, red, it's something that should not uh, uh, take into account because it's really negative. Uh, orange is uh, something that you should be cautious about. And green is a content that should be, should be respect. Uh, you can respect and you can take for granted. So uh, there are a few initiatives. It's not enough. Uh, part of what the U.S. is doing, what the, the uh, European Union is doing, and the, the new decision which has been taken by uh, Thierry Breton and Margaret Vestager, and also the decla de recent declaration of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, are uh, all in the right direction. It, but it takes too much time, and we need to act more faster. 
AB, we're all raking over the profits from Facebook. Uh, just reported in the past 24 hours a profit of 11.2 billion on revenues of 28 billion dollars in the final three months of 2020. So uh, a huge pivot uh, as people were seeking more social media under lockdown and, and certain parts around the world. How do we align the interests of uh, public and private companies down the track with the wider interest as we talk about protecting vulnerable groups in society? Thanks for that. I mean, let me start maybe in the positive end. Um, as, as a leader in, in, in civil society, um, advancing social transformation across many aspects, but particularly gender equality, we've also got to recognize that, that Facebook and Instagram and, and the social media platforms have had a huge positive impact on mobilizing for social justice. Uh, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matters, others that have, have started transformations across societies. So we have decided that, that we need to be both an ally with the social platforms as well as a challenger. So also be the challenging voice for making it a safe space for those that, that want to speak up. Because what we've also seen, and I mentioned the numbers before, as soon as you as a girl or a young woman take a stand on gender equality, on LGBT issues, on environmental issues or anything, then the harassment and abuse goes up massively. So you can't, as a social media company, be that wonderful open platform for, for enabling social justice. And then as soon as somebody um, uh, takes the floor, then not protect them against the violence and harassment that, that happens. Fortunately, after we launched our, our findings and report in October, um, both Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, they've all come to the table and said, listen, you work with these young activists. We don't really have access to them in the same way. So they've decided to sit down at the table uh, with the young, young female activists to really understand what is the particularity of the abuse that especially girls and young women feel. And, and what can they do about it in terms of their reporting requirements, how they publish data um, about the harassment, um, and, and what kinds of, of support that they can provide for their users um, to ensure that, that harassment goes down. But can I just say, I mean, I really welcomed what what the minister was saying, because this has to be a whole of society approach and it has to start at home with the caregivers in schools, etc., to make sure that we have the necessary education of, of children, boys and girls, in terms of what's good behavior online, as well as we need the legislative changes, because we cannot have legislation on violence against women or domestic violence, for example, that doesn't acknowledge the violence that happens online, because the consequences in terms of self-esteem, in terms of preventing girls and, and young women from aspiring to leadership, is, is tremendous and we're potentially losing out on a whole generation of future female leaders. And just quickly before we wrap up, uh, let me ask you then, AB, about this patchwork regulation where we applaud the efforts of the UAE. Do we need to see more leadership from the Biden administration because these are platforms that are housed, headquartered in the United States? Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. We need um, every leader with a voice, but yes, uh, certainly in North America, that would be great. Minister, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, thank you. <laughs> I'd love to. Well, I'd love to say that we are ready in the United Arab Emirates to uh, to collaborate, to extend our arms, knowledge, and to work collectively to ensure that the whole world is a better place. Um, if, if anything, this year have taught us, or the year before, have taught us that we're not only connected, but we are all. Everyone is affected by the other. Uh, if you can just imagine how our lives on uh, on on the online platforms and the digital uh, life that we have is even much more connected. Therefore, um, there's a lot of area for collaboration, uh, for voicing out the people's voice to ensure that public and private companies uh, are working uh, in alignment together.